We are in our study, The Lord Jesus Builds His Church, and we're going to see him do that even more today. Um, the subtitle of our church is, The Church Grows Under Intense Opposition. We saw opposition beginning in our last two studies, in chapter 3 and 4, and so today we'll come to chapter 5 as we do some review. Um, this is a famous painting by the Italian painter Raphael uh, of Peter preaching to the people in Jerusalem. And so I thought I'd put that up there just to change it up a little bit uh, as this section we're in dealing with opposition is also dealing with and showing the important work of witness, Christ's witnesses doing as he commanded them in Acts 1.8 uh, and what he previewed they would do in continuing the work of Christ. We saw in Acts 1.1 that, that as Jesus began to do, do and teach, uh, action and instruction behind the action, uh, he said, I want you to do the same. And they do it by the power of the Spirit. So we could say, and that's why the title says, the Lord Jesus builds his church. It would not be wrong, good morning, to say, the apostles build his church. It would not be wrong to say the Holy Spirit built his church. And that's why the subtitle is The Acts of Jesus Through His Word, Spirit, and Witness. And we pointed out the importance of this word through. Uh, very important in the Bible, in the New Testament. Uh, and I'll get slightly ahead. Well, let me just, I'll get there in a second. All right, so that's where we are. I was going to do just a bit of review, try not to do quite as much. Uh, we saw opposition beginning, as I mentioned. The witnesses are doing and teaching, just like Jesus did, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, then they are confined in chapter 4, put in jail for their witness. And we saw that the, those who are charging them with wrongdoing are theological liberals, and they are therefore threatened by the truth. And so that's a very common theme in history, uh, in the history of the church, in the history of Christ's teaching. Um, they are guilty. They have fear of man. They're jealous of the power that is now seen in these apostles, in these witnesses. And that's a really important point. I've tried to emphasize several times the importance and the emphasis on power in this study. Um, and the reason is, as we all said together last week, hard hearts, okay? So, or two weeks ago. So then last week we saw opposition continuing. Uh, they go then before the council, which is the Sanhedrin. They're very powerful men to oppose because they do have a lot of power. Uh, but they don't have near the power that God has. And so we see uh, them later uh, confused we see the apostles answering, Peter particularly, obeying God rather than men. We talked about the importance of Christian ethics. We see that again in this lesson. Come, come forward here in this lesson as well. And then we saw the community flourishing. And I use that word because really if you think about it and if you study sociology, anthropology in high school or college, uh, if you pay attention to political discourse in our country even today, whether it be movements of late like BLM or DEI and on and on and on, this word right here is what ultimately everybody seeks. Everybody who is a thinker, they think, uh, and is wanting to try to do good. All right? Human flourishing. How does that occur? And we see in that end of that last study in chapter 4 that this community of witnesses is flourishing. All right? So, and we also notice some attributes of that community. They're a community of theology, prayer, and boldness. They wanted to be bold witnesses. They prayed for boldness, and the Lord answers that prayer. We see it again here in this lesson today. And here's the thing I wanted to point out. I, didn't, I failed to mention it last week, but when we talk about the Spirit of God working through people, 
and the Holy Spirit working through the apostles. Um, we call that the doctrine of concurrence, and I just failed to get that out last week, so I wanted to mention that. Uh, that's why I can say the title could be the church, the Lord Jesus grows his church, the apostles grow the church, the Holy Spirit grow the church, okay? So uh, I just wanted to point that out because I failed to do so. But that's what that is referred to, the doctrine of concurrence, all right? And we talked about agency a little bit concerning their moral requirement, uh, their causal function as agents to make certain things occur. They, ha they have the freedom of will to execute actions just like you do and I do that are very real. They have very real consequence and, and uh, outcome. Uh, but ultimately, because God is sovereign, and so when we talk about power, there is no greater power in existence anywhere than God's power. And his uh, sovereign power to execute concurrence through moral agents and the causes that he ultimately wants to occur. Okay? So really, really important thinking points here. And then we saw that they're also the community of love, grace, and power. And we're going to read that section again now as we come to chapter 5. So if you'll look with me at chapter 4, we'll begin in 32. And I'm going to read down through chapter 5, verse 11, on this uh, intensely, intensifying opposition. Last week, we were looking, in the last couple of weeks, we were looking at opposition from external sources. Today, we see opposition from inside the church as we come to Ananias and Sapphira. So, to set the stage, let's look at 432 and down from there. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But... A man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. All right. No doubt you've heard that story many times, read it, probably heard it preached. Uh, this is a dramatic event uh, that occurs in this very new fledgling church. So let's look then at this. Uh, we'll start here with this account. Problems in paradise. I had said before, uh, the church was a snapshot of paradise. Uh, well, we have trouble in paradise now. Why do we have trouble in paradise from a general conception? Why is there trouble in paradise in the church? 
this new wonderful community. Three letter word, sin, right? Okay, uh, we, we could say that, couldn't we? Whoa, I don't want that. Try something else, Charlie. How about this? Okay, my subtitle, The First Church Growth Strategy. How's that for, uh, you know, growing a church, so to speak? By the way, I prefer expansion. Growth is one thing, and expanding numbers is another, but you know what I mean. Usually the people in the church growth movement uh, can, can refer to it as growth. Uh, yeah, this is not the way to uh, win friends and influence people, to have them come to church and get killed at the altar. But uh, anyway, we see it grow anyway, don't we? <clears throat> All right, so sin. Um, just a, a couple of questions here as we, as we begin. So we're looking at internal opposition here now because these people are, are in the church, aren't, aren't they? How do we know that? How do we know they're in the church or of the church? Was there any clue in the text? Verse 32 that I read first. Those who believed were of one heart and soul. Well, they were of one heart and one soul, but then Ananias and Sapphira contrived their sinful ruse, and it no longer was so. And so we have this fracture that occurs in the church. Uh, you noticed also I emphasized Luke there writing but in chapter 5, verse 1, but a man named Ananias. So we have a twist in the plot, as it were, and uh, as we come to this story. Um, let me ask you this. Why was it important that the apostles did their work in Jesus' name? This, this goes back even in the other chapters, so I want to say it kind of at the outset. Why are they doing these things in Jesus' name? Remember that word power I pointed out earlier? What power do the apostles have as men? Some men are more powerful than others, aren't they? For various reasons. We can immediately think of physical strength, maybe. But are these apostles... Uh, in any way, these men, Peter, is he in any way, in and of himself, powerful? No. So he is, uh, he has power that is derivative, would be the word we might use. It's derived power. And it's because he has submitted himself to the will of God, to the will of Christ, to obey Christ, and to therefore function in the name of Christ. So Christ has the power. Uh, the Spirit of God has the power. And so that's why... Uh, Peter does in Jesus' name. Okay? All right. <clears throat> they recognize the truth. They have no power in themselves. Um, since Jesus is doing the work, it's only right that he get the credit. Right? So, pretty simple. But that also contrasts what we see here from Ananias and Sapphira, where they are not submitting to the will of God and the power of God to do what is seemingly almost supernatural, all right? Uh, as opposed to Barnabas, who kind of sets the stage here. There are others, but they highlight Barnabas, Luke does, in the text. And he does this very uncommon thing, doesn't he? And so then they try to follow suit, but not exactly. Uh, we, we said that this is why they did what they did, sin. But how does the text in verse 3 when Peter inquires of Ananias what's going on, how does, it, how does he show that? Satan filled your heart. Why has Satan filled your heart? Um, what, what do you, in, in thinking of our previous studies and, and the book of Acts here so far, what word kind of stands out there to you? Filled. Why? Why filled? Yeah, because it's contrasting the earlier, earlier filling in Acts 2, isn't it? Where the Holy Spirit filled them. So we have a direct contrast here where Satan is filling instead of the Holy Spirit filling. Um, so, you know, I, I, now how does Satan, you know, influence or fill, you know, using that word, Peter's being, in, or excuse me, Luke's being intentional here. How does a believer, because we believe they're probably believers here, these two people. 
How does Satan influence a believer that way, like that? What has to happen in advance of that? What does the believer have to do or not do? Might be a better term. <laughs> what do we know later Paul commands us as believers to do relative to this issue right here? What does the New Testament command believers to do relative to filling? Be filled, right, with the Holy Spirit. So there, there is some uh, disobedience, some lack of faithfulness on the part of Ananias and Sapphira that causes this, this issue of Satan influencing them, filling them, to then therefore lie to the Holy Spirit. So what might we say this sin is here? And it, it's, it might not be immediately apparent to you. Uh, he calls it lying to the Holy Spirit. And so we could say the sin is lying, but to a greater degree, what's going on here and how do we label it? And I know that's a lot to ask because you probably didn't, maybe you didn't read this in advance or think about it in detail like I had to. Uh, it's, a, it's a word that starts with H. Hardness is certainly causing it. <clears throat> Absolutely. Hardness. But there's another descriptor of a particular sin that I'm looking for. Hypocrisy. Okay? Hypocrisy. And we all know, how attractive is a hypocrite? You know, in terms of personal relations with someone that you're able to perceive they're, they're a hypocrite. <clears throat> you know something about them and they're hiding it, you know? It's a terrible thing, isn't it? And here's another way of expressing it that to me is particularly egregious pretense. Uh, pretense in the church is an awful, awful thing. It's an awful thing for anybody. And you can see the word pretend in there. Do you know anybody that kind of pretends to be something they're not? Or have known? Have you ever pretended to be something you're not? Guilty? We all are, aren't we? We're all, we're all guilty of that, <clears throat> at least the temptation, if not the actual deed. All right, so pretense, hypocrisy, that's what's going on here. Uh, he's allowed Satan to fill his heart and influence him to do this awful thing. Uh, now, at, at the core of this pretense, there's a motivation going on. So when we look at crimes <laughs> or sins, what's the motive? What's, what's the context of the story? Pride certainly is at play. What happened, though, in the, in the story here at the end of chapter 4? Barnabas does this deed. He does this action. Remember, our Christianity could be somewhat at least encapsulated in action and attitude. Right? We see that a lot. Action and attitude. And hopefully the action is motivated by the right attitude. But sometimes those get crossed. And we can do a deed, but the attitude is incorrect in the motive. And what would you think, well, first of all, this God that's being described here and being shown here, this God, Yahweh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his Holy Spirit, do we, we, I mean, okay, being very simplistic, he has all power. He knows everything. So how smart is an action that's incongruent with a deed? I'm, excuse, excuse me, with an attitude. Not very smart, 
right? I mean, it's kind of stupid, kind of dumb. Uh, so therefore, pretense is pretty stupid, isn't it? Because the only one that really matters in the universe is able to see through this incongruity and this pretense and judge with perfect judgment on that incongruity. Uh, so, and we also refer to this, it just occurs to me in the moment, you know, we, we appreciate this in people, right? Can you all see that? Integrity. Is, does this little diagram that I just drew, does it illustrate integrity? An integrated attitude and action. No, it does not. So there's no integrity there. And any organization, any person that does not have integrity is broken. The word integrity comes, I've told you all this before, it's from the word integer. Integer means unified one. Mathematicians help me. Um, and there, there's a break in that, isn't there? So there's no integrity. Um, and, and lack of integrity in any family, any church, any community is devastating, potentially, to the mission or the goal of that organization. So, uh, pretense, motivated by pride, certainly. Uh, what other sins now? Okay, again, in light of the context, Barnabas has done this deed. And we, we see that Barnabas, when he did it, the A equals the A. That's what's clearly indicated by Luke in the text. This is a, a very good man. We see him come back in, up in the book of Acts later. Uh, some of y'all know the ministry of John Piper. He named one of his sons Barnabas um, because it's such a good name of a very good godly man. So we know with lots of evidence that this guy uh, Barnabas did the right thing for the right reason. But because he is praised and touted in the church for that good deed and highlighted in some way, he didn't know that was going to happen. He didn't intend it necessarily. Uh, it sets up Ananias, who does have this pride in his heart. What other things are in his heart? Yeah. Love of money, greed. And what is he greedy for? Certainly money, maybe. Okay, so he's got this parcel of land in our vernacular, in our times. He sells it for $100,000. He walks into the church with $50,000. And this idea of laying it at the apostles' feet simply means present it to the apostles, to the church, to be used. Maybe there was a, a formal or a, or a uh, coming forward thing. I don't know. I'm sure it highlighted them, okay? We know that. It gave them notoriety. Um, and the text also indicates very clearly they, they let it be known that they were giving the full amount. They sold the property for $50,000. But they didn't. They sold it for 100000 And again, I'm just throwing out numbers for illustration. And that they were getting credit for selling and giving all the money that they had sold the land for. So love of money, greed, what else? Sorry? Oh, Mike wins the award today. Wow. I didn't think anybody would get it. Brother, awesome. Give him a nickel. Glory. Is that an important word in the Bible? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So not only do we have all these other things, greed and stuff, love of money, lying, we have... Theft. What kind of thievery is going on relative to glory? Stealing the glory of whom? The Lord Jesus and his spirit, right? Because when the people praise the Lord for the giving, that then alleviates suffering and, and want and need in this community of paradise that's going on. Chapter 4, the Lord Jesus is getting the credit, and the glory of God is. But now, these folks have chosen to steal that glory and 
give some, have, accrue some to themselves. And, and then on top of all of that, what does, this, what does all of sin do to people? Does it make them free or does it make them a slave? So with all of this going on, in addition to everything, these people, Ananias and, Sir, and Sapphira, are enslaving themselves to sin. It's kind of like, you know, we have that phrase, cut off to your nose to spite your face. It's kind of like that. Why are you doing this? Okay, so, and then I have one more question for you because we like to emphasize big God theology. How big is God to Ananias? Not very, is he? But then we go, well, how big is he to me when I do similar things or you? God help us all, right? <clears throat> Greed, covetousness, jealousy, lust for prominence, which might glory, right? Rightfully, that's where we were going to get to eventually. Deceit, pretense. Proverbs 15, 8 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. Wicked people can still outwardly praise God, come to church, be faithful, serve even. Oh, my goodness, folks. We have really, 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 really got to be careful about this right here and not fall into this right here. Right. God help us. All right, a couple other real quick thank you, a little tidbits here. Um, because, by the way, there was no admonition by Peter, by the Lord Jesus through Peter, that they had to sell anything or give anything. The text makes that very clear, doesn't it? There was no compulsion here to do this. No requirement. There's no requirement outwardly for any of us to give time, talent, or treasure other than the Word of God telling us if we love Christ, we'll serve Him faithfully. But let's be very sure that our motive doesn't outstrip our action as we serve him, right? Uh, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells them, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Lord Jesus is going to give us the kingdom. We are inheritors of great wealth. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You've, you've heard that text many times, but it has direct application to what we see here from these people and, and even our own lives, of course. All right. Um, now, there's another, we talked about extracting doctrine from texts, and we were going to try to do that in Acts, and I went back and recovered concurrence earlier. Uh, what is a, a doctrine about, literally the doctrine of God, okay? It's the very highest doctrine. Uh, theology proper, the scholars refer to it. Is there anything in there about God that we can, and the triune God that we could see and be informed of? And I'm only pointing it out as an exercise that we read our Bibles this way, really, uh, because you already know it in your head. Notice verse 8. Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out. And then earlier, who did he say he had lied to? Holy Spirit, and then in verse, uh, the end of verse 4, you have not lied to man but to God. If we put all that together, and okay, it's a dumb moment, but I just want you to read your Bibles this way, okay? Holy Spirit is God. We just have a tri triune uh, 
reinforcement here from Luke. Okay. Uh, the, these people were fearful of the wrong things. They did not fear God to the degree they should so that it affects their motive, and we also have to be careful of that. They're presumptuous. They presume upon God's grace even. And people, we, we can often do that. When we talked about a community of grace earlier, and I read in verse latter part of chapter 4, we saw the grace of God being evident there. Um, grace is not a freedom to be a slacker by loving things, but a power to move forward in growth and godliness and love Christ and people, to defeat Satan and sin and not submit to him. So, grace. Uh, they, they, are, they, they have cheap grace here, and they don't, they don't see it as they should. Okay. Hypocrisy, then, is a corruption, and it is contagious, too, by the way. If you have a pretentious church, people that are pretentious, particularly leadership, because everything kind of starts and ends with leadership, if you have pretentious leaders, uh, it's going to affect others. And so I just want to point out, not only is this bad for individuals, it's bad for the community because it's contagious. Uh, it's also hypocrisy, then, is the seed of cynicism. What, begins peop what, what makes people start to be cynical? about a church or about a set of leaders or uh, maybe a, a Bible study leader or whatever it might be, um, even a parent in a home. What makes a young child who's starting to grow into teenage and getting kind of aware, you know, of things, what can cause them to be cynical and ultimately reject the Lord Jesus? Pretense. So as parents, that's why it's so important that we live godly, first of all, <laughs> And we pray, oh Lord, make my heart pure that I might purely follow you and act according to that purity. But when we foul up, we've got to, and it's obvious, we, we've got to be able, and man enough and woman enough, to humble ourselves and say, hey kids, dad messed up on this. Because that's the only way we can return to integrity. It's interesting now, these people were not given an opportunity to repent, were they? in the text. And so we, we have to conclude with the help of scholars who studied this repeatedly that the Lord was wanting to send a very clear signal here. He is wanting to strike fear in the heart of the church members at that time and of all times. And we do ourselves a favor as a church and as individuals if we recognize that uh, fearful strike. Now, again, we believe and can see in the text they probably were believers. So they went to be with the Lord, but their physical life ended instantly. So they had repented, we, we have to assume, because you can't come to know the Lord unless you repent and believe. And the text shows they were all in one accord and all believing, but they let influence happen. They didn't fight the good fight. <clears throat> and then the Lord sent a powerful signal in killing them on the scene. But his, well, the point I want to make, though, is hypocrisy is the seed of cynicism, and we have to be careful because it ripples in so many directions. So God help us. Dr. MacArthur says, Jesus said, An enemy sows tares among the wheat, and the enemy is Satan who sows the hypocrites among the genuine. This literally sucks the power out of the church, corrupts the unity of the church, devastates the testimony of the church, confusing the world. Having superficially committed people in the church is not helpful. They may feel good about it, but it doesn't help the church. It doesn't help them, and it doesn't advance the gospel effectively because it confuses people as to what a Christian really is. That's a broad general statement about Believers and unbelievers in the church, but a good statement in, in, in any case. All right, so what's the result of this event here? Does the church cease to exist? I made a joke and I said the first church growth strategy. Uh, what happens to the church? 
Look at verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. And then we have to go on forward then to our next section to see further results of what happens. Um, but we could, we could summarize and conclude that purity is reestablished from this event. Uh, <clears throat> and that was promised in the New Covenant. You know, we have, we have a couple of different, very important New Covenant prophecies. In other words, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, Israel is promised a New Covenant. Remember that? And so there are two or three places, prophets, that tell us that. Does anybody happen to remember who one of those might be? Jeremiah, a weeping prophet. There's another one that comes to mind that I'm going to read you from him in a second. Ezekiel. Thank you, Robert. All right, Ezekiel. Listen to the New Covenant language in Ezekiel 36, prophesying of the New Covenant which we see being born here. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. God. All right. So we see him promising the spirit that will give them a new heart, purify them, cleanse them uh, in the new covenant. What else do we see? Now, I, I knew, I told Kelly, I, this... This section is so important, I think, and I'm just going to take some extra time um, because it has so much direct application to us in our lives. Um, I may, we may go ahead and read the next section here, but um, what, if you know what goes on next, if you look in your Bible at verse 12, right above the title, there's probably a heading by the editors. Mine says, Many Signs and Wonders Done. <coughs> We could read verse 12, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So what are other results then of the event that took place in the earlier part of the chapter that we can see here? How might we categorize it? <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, and we put, I'm going to read that to you in a second. Uh, point number two, though, would be out of that section I read, powerful works and witness. Is that fair? Power. Power happens, continues to happen. Um, fear, Robert mentioned fear. Times two in both directions. Fear to join, fear not to join. <laughs> Anybody have fear joining the Emmanuel Bible Church? <laughs> well, if we really, really understood all the impacts, we might would have had a little more fear, right? Because once you join the community of faith, what now happens to you or me? Accountability. It's kind of like getting married, isn't it? Because uh, uh, was any male in here? I'll just speak of men because I'm in. Was any male in here afraid of getting married? Oh my goodness, I was scared to death. Partly because I knew the responsibility was so great, I knew my own heart was so wicked, and I was not even a saved man. Uh, I was afraid of getting married, not to her, because by then I was a committed believer, and I was just so thankful to have a family put back together and have her love me, but. As a lost man, I was afraid of getting married. 
So it's kind of like that. I mean, we ought to have fear because we're going to have accountability. We ought to be afraid that we might start to fall away. And that fear can then, okay, talk about motive, then motivate us to be honest about ourselves to the Lord and to ourselves and then pray for God to help us. And then how do we remain faithful? How do we proceed forward in faith day by day, step by step, so that our fear isn't realized? What do we do? And, and I'm going to repeat a foot stomper. Right? The means of grace. How do we remain faithful? We, re, we just read, read the word, you know. A little bit every week, if not every day. A lot, maybe. Maybe you don't read two days, but for the third day, you spend an hour. You know, you're just studying Ananias and Sapphira and, oh, Lord, teach me on reading some commentary and just trying to have my heart cut away all the fleshiness and wickedness. Um, the means of grace, the word of God, the community of faith, prayer, fellowship with the saints, even singing, you know, we, we can kind of get broad with our definitions, but technically, word, sacrament, prayer, <clears throat> okay. So that's how we do it. Uh, but yeah, fear, very important concept here that is brought forward in this. And then the other people were afraid to join because they don't have that circumcised heart and they know it and they literally are afraid of going into this community and getting killed. I mean, they have seen these two people, they've heard the story. If they weren't present or nearby, they go see the grave, you know. And by the way, they always, in Judaism at the time, they always bury people immediately. Uh, some, many preachers have preached this text and pointed out this proves church should be three hours because um, they were still preaching and singing when the, they come back in to get the girl, the lady. Um, and then some have said, well, it took her three hours to fix her hair, get her makeup on, all these things because she was pretentious anyway. Uh, all that's just for jokes. But uh, anyway, great fear comes upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Uh, so fear times two. Um, and then, what else? I made the joke about church growth strategy, but what, I mean, what does the text tell us in verse 14? Yep, more and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Now, what's important about that in terms of the themes of Acts? The Lord Jesus builds his church through the apostles, the Holy Spirit, and the Word. So the Word's being preached. The Word is in powerfully demonstrate, demonstrated in the death of these people. Power is seen. Expansion happens, growth. And so the, the, the church continues to grow exponentially. Great, great numbers. In just a few weeks... 20, 30,000 people, perhaps, okay? Because we saw in the other text, 5,000 men alone. So anyway, so in terms of the themes of Acts, we see that backed up here in this text in verse 14. Um, and then there's so much power that even the shadow of Peter and the other apostles falling across people who are invalids or sick or whatever are being healed. So what does that make you think about? No doubt hundreds are being healed. At least dozens are being healed. What does that make you think of? In recent past at this time. The Lord Jesus ministry, right? So there's a direct connection that we're supposed to make here from what Jesus told these men that I, I, we will do this, you will do this, and then Luke records they did do it. In other words, the Spirit did come, he empowered them, and he continues to do his work through them. Simply because they are submissive to the will of God. We could say obedient. Had, had Peter been obedient his whole tenure in life as a follower of Christ? No. Did he have a lot of power in his life? 
No, but now he does. By God's mercy and grace. Uh, and so these are the results that we see and ultimately the powerful works of and of witness. Okay. Um, I was going to read you this quote here real quick as we finish. As the greatness, this is John Calvin. As the greatness thereof did at that time terrify them all, so it is unto us a testimony that God cannot abide this unfaithfulness, when as bearing a show of holiness where there is none, we do mock him contemptibly. This was the Lord's purpose by punishing one to make the rest afraid that they might reverently beware of all hypocrisy. And that which Luke saith that they feared doth appertain unto us also. For God meant to give all ages a lesson at that time that they may learn to deal sincerely and uprightly with him. Very good. Any comment or question? All right. As you can probably tell, this uh, in, inflamed my heart for five or six days. <laughs> um, and it has been good for me. I hope it has helped you as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time we've had. We thank you for this severe warning to this early church and to all churches down through the ages. Lord, help us not to be a Revelation 2 and 3 church that you uh, are angry with and displeased with and want to spew out of your mouth. Help us, Lord, to be inflamed for you and for your glory and not our own. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.